Welcome to Cruise Ship Crime Investigators, the book series. Book three, cruise traffic. That's human trafficking. Chapter one, wrong answer. Day one, Miami, 9.30 in the morning. Same time in Bequay, a Caribbean island. Everything is bright white in the blistering early morning sun except for the dried blood under Kieran's nose. His hair is not long enough to cover the healing wound and the operation scars on his skull. He is either dead or in a deep sleep, stretched out on a chair with his feet on the rails of the first floor veranda. Beautiful bourgainvillea and birdsong add to his serene peace. The cell phone in his top pocket wakes him. His jumpy overreaction shows that not only has his wartime PTSD never been cured, but the recent injury has added to his unstable state. Kieran, buddy, I need you back here, is the forceful American voice that does not need to be put on the speaker to dominate the tranquility. No, Kieran says, waking. Great, comes through the speaker. Not great, that's no. Kieran insists politely, with the charm of his perfect English officer's diction. It is soft, not at all aggressive, but definite. His unwillingness to work may be due to his recuperation in the Caribbean island of Bequay, but Hunter's insistence from Miami suggests the extended holiday in paradise is over. I'll pick you up from the airport. No, Kieran says. He ends the call and draws his feet back. Now awake, he stands, slipping the cell phone back into his breast pocket. The rise makes him dizzy, and he steps forward to maintain his balance. Holding the door frame, the ex-military officer brushes his tailored white shorts straight before moving to the bedroom of the house. The internal doors are open, and there are faint voices from downstairs. Back in Miami, Hunter stands silhouetted at a large window with his smartphone to his ear. Great, he says. Then spinning his cell like a gunslinger, he turns back to address the room. He's on his way. He sits at the dark polished wood conference table opposite two young executives in expensive, well-cut suits who ooze ambition. Their name badges say... Chet Dean and Bjorn Ironside, three King's executives. The name badge is an essential uniform accessory used on ships and continued on land by some companies. They feel the meeting is over. Diana Mond waits to be dismissed. Her badge is far from straight, and the cut of her black trouser suit and cheap heavy shoes show no ambition other than to finish the day. Hunter sits defiantly, with nothing more than a smile. He is willing to take their money. Although the job, as explained, feels too small for them to have been engaged, it is ideal for Kieran's return. Kieran will be on the ship. I'll run the operation from here, he says to break the silence, that has given no added information. As a job for two agents on board the ship, I'll give him an assistant. No, we need both of you as a team. Hunter stops spinning the phone and surreptitiously records shots of both executives. There's one cabin available, but two men can be a couple, Bjorn says. Oh, oh no. Bjorn is the more serious of the two and defends the idea of two men in a cabin. There's no longer any need to explain. Gender is a flexible scale. My wife's pregnant. I like my position on the scale. Deal memo, Chet says, sliding a paper across the table. The ship sails from Lisbon tomorrow, Bjorn says, without a smile. Diana will deal with your flights and boarding documents. I'll read it over, Hunter says, rising. Chapter 2. Laundry Wars In the taxi, back to his office, Hunter studies the memo. The problem simply says that chocolate bars are being thrown into the laundry dryers on each of the three king ships. 
investigate organised crime. Hunter worked as head of security on cruise ships for many years after leaving the military. He is aware the laundry can be an epicentre of conflict. The only thing that elevates the problem enough for it to be contracted out is the term organised crime. Even though it has happened on each of the three king ships that are on rotation in the Mediterranean Sea, it is still a soft case, unless he is not being told everything. He calls Kieran again. Miami and St Vincent are in the same time zone, even if the two men are not yet on the same page. Kieran Phillips walks out of his stylishly decorated washroom into the lavish bathroom. His face is now clean of dried blood. He takes the ringing cell phone from the bed where the pillow reveals yellow pus and a few dark red spots from the night. He collects his beach-filled straw trilby hat from the hook on the door as he answers. Caribbean office? OK, I'm laughing, Hunter says, walking past the boarded-up commercial units in a less attractive side of Miami. He enters Wild Mary's diner, which is chaotically busy. I'm back at the office. I can hear, and I'm not missing the smell of diesel, Kieran mocks, via his shirt pocket. He stands at the top of the stairs by a large open window. White net curtains move gently in the soft breeze. He carefully takes the first step down. So, someone's been murdered on a ship and you can't cope without me. No, there's been a few chocolate bars thrown in tumble dryers. I thought you could work your way off the sub's bench slowly. Kieran pulls up at the remark, slips and falters at the top of the stairs. He catches himself before a tumble and sits on one of the treads. A fall nearly killed him on his last job and it flashes through his head as he takes a moment. Macy... A young black woman is cooking at the grill of Wild Mary's red and cream retro diner. Help, Crock says as he squeezes past Hunter, taking dirty plates through to the utility and piles them with others. He reappears to throw an apron at Hunter and add an order docket to the row in front of Macy. Two for breakfast, egg, over easy, table 14. Hunter passes Macy and puts his cell phone down next to the dishes in the back room. He opens the dishwasher to load it, but it is full. He takes a dish from the inside, but it's dirty. Couldn't this have been switched on? He calls towards the grill. You weren't here, Macy shouts back at him. You need me because you're working in the diner, Kieran asks via the phone. I need you because I have a very pregnant wife, and Mary and Stan are still on the cruise that we organised for them, Hunter says, switching the washer on, then going to the sink and washing his hands. He aims his voice towards his smartphone. It's a minor problem on the MS Magi Mur on the Mediterranean. You'll have it down in a day or two and be back on the beach. Hello, Hunter, is a reply from a female voice. Pivot, Hunter, a monotone Russian adds. Ah, Georgie, Bedriska, a happy trio out there in the sun, Hunter responds. Georgie and Bedriska are on either side of Kieran as they leave the hilltop house. The commander puts his trilby hat on to protect his head from the sun as Georgie closes the outside gate. They quick step across the empty road, linking arms. Kieran is walking well. I need you to come back. Today, Hunter relays from Miami. I can't see any reason to ever leave here, Kieran says, entering a footpath that cuts between endless colourful buds with fragrant smells. But Riska sets the pace up front. They have been caring for the patient. OK, how about it's time to plan on getting our $16 million back? Then we can all retire to the beach. Georgie, you still in earshot? Bedriska stops sharply and turns, charging her partner with an inquisitive glare. Georgie shakes her head, not to worry, 
and waves her to carry on walking, but Bedriska stands firm. Sixteen million? She mouths at Georgie. We'll never get it, Georgie whispers to Betty, who has never been told of that money. Bedriska doesn't look pleased. We listen to plan, Bedriska says, taking the telephone and going ahead of the others, although Hunter is easily heard by all three. They have the whole beach to themselves. Georgie walks bare feet in the shallows, her white pants finishing just below the knee and her beach shoes in one hand. She pulls Kieran into the sea, and he stumbles a little as he pulls off his shoes and steps into the warm water. She holds him up, arm in arm, laughing. Bedriska is not laughing. She is on the hard sand, so her Ralph Lauren white sayer pumps do not get wet. You want to take Georgie? It's a job for a couple. He is not coupled with Georgie, Betty says firmly. She's not an investigator and she's got a job. Not that you'd think it, Kieran jokes loudly. I work every day. I deserve my weeks off the ship, she says. I'll call Prisha, they hear Hunter suggest on the phone. She would have to leave her job to join you. Take Elaine. Kieran suggests. No, she ain't an investigator, plus she can't cruise after 24 weeks pregnancy. Is it still too early to say congratulations? Georgie asks, grabbing Kieran's arm and drifting over to Betty and leaning to speak to the phone. Georgie looks up at Bedriska and mouths, I'm jealous. I want a baby. Betty is not smiling. Thanks, Georgie. Scan's all good. Elaine's well they all hear. Congratulations, Georgie and Kieran shout, which Betty repeats out of synchronization. Congratulations. You got a party going on? Hunter asks. No, we're walking to Jack's bar on the beach for breakfast, Georgie explains. Tell me about money, Bedriska orders. Hang on, our favorite journalist has just walked in. Hunter announces. I'll call you back. No, leave the line open. I want to hear her side of this, Kieran says. 